The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January regular Board of Education meeting for the Green Bay Area Public School District. Uh, call the meeting to order and begin with roll call. And Beth, if you could help us with that, please. Thank you. McCoy. Here. Leighton and Morin. Here. Welch. Here. Vanden Hovo. Here. Becker. Here. Warren. Here. Smith. Here. All right, uh, we are, all seven board members are present. We are also joined tonight by Superintendent Steve Murley, along with members of his cabinet in person and virtually. We're also joined by two members of the Inner City Student Council tonight, uh, Emily Kopp and Megan Jonnet from Preble High School. Thank you for joining us. We'll get to you in just a few seconds. Um, but next on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and then we'll move on to our mission statement, which will be so graciously read by Don Smith. We educate all students to be college, career, and community ready, inspired to succeed in our diverse world. Thank you, Don. All right, uh, moving on to the next section, we have open forum, and there we will start with our inner city student council report. And so I will hand that over to Emily and or Megan. All right, thank you. So we're just gonna try to talk over some good news for the ICSC report uh, this month. So from East, the boys basketball team had an 11 game winning streak, which was really awesome to see. Uh, West, the girls basketball team beat East uh, 34 to 28, led by Ashante Williams with 30 points. Um, and they had auditions for the year, this year's musical, which is Be More Chill. And that just took place. Um, at Preble, we had two students. One of them is actually Megan, so I just want to congratulate her. But two students have advanced to the Junior Achievement Live competition. Uh, they placed in the top four and will compete uh, January 24th in Appleton to hopefully advance to the state level. Um, our academic decathlon team took first in their regional competition, and they're ranked third in the state among all other academic decathlon teams. Um, Preble Boys Basketball recently had like a, a really good game. Uh, they had a buzzer beater three point shot that sent them into overtime and they ended up winning against, I believe a Sheboygan team by one point. And then I'll give it to Megan. So far, good news, good news for Southwest. Um, uh, Southwest academic team under challenging circumstances earned multiple awards at last week's regional competition. Uh, their tickets are on sale for their upcoming production of Mamma Mia, and they have a virtual art exhibit, what's, which is available um, and created by the Southwest Drawing and Painting um, One students. Jadol had a spirit week and a winter dance featuring dress up days like villain versus hero day and anything but a backpack day. And some district wide news is our DECA district four competition on all of the schools for GBAPS. We had 79 participants, uh, six participants had took first place, four for second, three for third and five took fourth. And we had a total of 54 participants take home a medal. Jadal, Preble, Southwest, and West are all getting ready for finals this week, and there was a district-wide math meet today. 
Excellent. Any questions for Emily or Megan? All right, thank you for the update, ladies. We appreciate it. All right, uh, last item in open forum is the public comment section. I don't believe we have anyone that registered. Beth, is that correct? That is correct. There are no um, requests for public participation. All right, thank you very much. Um, moving on then to item number three, the consent agenda for approval first. Are there any items uh, on the consent agenda that anyone would like removed for discussion? Um, I'd like to remove D, please. Okay. Any other items? All right, so moving uh, item D from the consent agenda, I would look for a motion to approve the remaining consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, there are none. All right, then, uh, or sorry, that item passes. Um, moving on then to item four, items withdrawn from the consent agenda. Andrew, I'll hand it over to you to uh, discuss letter D, open enrollment space designation. Uh, thank you. So this, until the time comes, I think when we're, have very little limitation on, um, on these spaces, it seems to me that this is too controversial of a of an item. There's too much in it that for it to be on a consent agenda. Um, as I've said other years, I respect I respect the work that goes into this, and I understand the situation that we that we are in with staff shortages and so forth. The uh, problem that we share with surrounding districts. I also appreciate the fact that we uh, don't uh, don't make people transfer back out if they start an IEP after they're in, but it's too just because it would be better if no one if no one limited and allowed for free movement between between every place uh, between schools and. Others don't, and that would be negative for us to do so. Philosophically, to say that we are limiting the people who can come in when we have a, a district that is struggling with with too many transfers out, uh, to have only these four spaces open uh, just goes a little too far for me. So, although I respect I respect the work that went into this, I I think there are too many too few too few spots here when we are losing net enrollment for me to be able to vote yes on this. Um, and whether this was going to be seven zero or not, it seems to me to be a thing with more, I guess, more emotion wrapped around it sometimes than it should fit in a consent agenda. Any other comments? Andrew, I'll just share, and I think you and I have had this conversation before. Um, I respect the principle of every reason why uh, you struggle with this item. Um, and uh, from a philosophical standpoint, I, I don't feel good about uh, the, the way that this is set up from a statewide standpoint about limiting the, the people who can come in. And um, so I, I, I totally get it from a, where I sit here and, and having to make decisions that I feel like are best for the Green Bay Public School District. I see why we have to, to pass this. So totally get it. All right, um, then with that, if there are any other comments, I'd look for a motion to approve the open enrollment space designation. So moved. Second. Second. Andrew, would you like to take a individual vote? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Beth? Thank you. Leighton and Morin? Aye. Welch? Aye. Smith? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Warren? Aye. Bandon Hubel? Aye. Motion carries uh, seven zero. Uh, All no. right. You you said I, Andrew. 
I saw that. Didn't he? Yes. I don't know. Can we go back and change it? Andrew, you're muted. I'm sorry. Melissa, can can he go back and change that vote? We've already. I think I can ask unanimous consent to if there's unanimous consent to change to change my vote. It's uh, similar to what's been done in city council meetings. Can you give me one minute, please? Yep. Andrew's right by unanimous consent. They can, um, he can change his vote. All right, is anyone opposed to Andrew changing his vote? No. This is unanimous consent. All right. Uh, there's unanimous consent uh, for Andrew to change his vote on uh, item D, the open or own space designation from the consent agenda. So in which case the motion carries six to one. All right, uh, moving forward, committee meeting reports. We'll start with the education committee meeting and I will hand it over to the committee chair, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had three items on the agenda. The largest one was the equity, diversity, and inclusion update. And we had some excellent presentations. And I just wanted to, I guess, highlight a, a couple of things here about um, some, of the, some of the administrators that we heard from at, at different levels. Uh, we heard from Jason Johnson at NEW School of Innovation and looked at some of the work that they've done in uh, going through uh, equity training and beyond diversity training. Um, we also, and I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna say the name wrong, Nat Natalie Ninehouse, is that right? Or Ninehouse? I wanna make sure, someone tell me, I wanna make sure I'm saying it right. I think it's Neenhouse. Neenhouse? Okay. So we had um, in her presentation, there was, I guess, one thing that really caught my attention that I think is important to, to share uh, because there is actually a culturally responsive uh, teaching practices and equity, an equity walkthrough tool. And with uh, just a couple things I'd highlight from that, which we talked about in the committee meeting as well. There's this perception out there that there is this secret, um, secret, I don't know, woke list of things to do in the, the classroom. And I just wanted to highlight some of the things that are actually on the list of equitable classroom practices, because really, I think most would most would agree who would look at this this list. There are just things that are good. It's just good educational practice um, altogether. Uh, making sure to having teachers make sure to pay attention equally to all students, to make uh, to make eye contact with all students, being aware of cultural or just individual preferences for more or less eye contact, um, learning you know, learning people's names and saying them correctly, uh, providing different types of groups, not always having kids pick their own groups, sometimes choosing random groups and so forth when you're doing, when you're doing group work, um, making sure that, uh, making sure you're providing both individual help and working with the, the classroom. There's, these are all good practices for, for equity and, so that was an important thing to highlight, I think, that there are the equitable classroom practices and just the regular uh, good teaching practices that we've been modeling for many years. And um, perhaps Nancy could elaborate a little bit on this as well, because she's, uh, she's lived them in our classrooms for, for many years. Um, seeking multiple perspectives on on issues and asking if there's other perspectives, not 
pushing a perspective, not pushing a narrative, asking if there's other perspectives that uh, people have in a discussion, that students have in a discussion. So I thought that was, uh, that was very valuable to look at, uh, illustrating that, again, we're, our good teaching practices are aligned with, are aligned with equity, are aligned with giving students what they need and respecting the individual. Um, committee members, Nancy or Brenda, do you have anything to add? Um, I'd like to say exactly what you're, you've said is true. But also, you know, it's not only just in the classroom that all of these things work. It works in a board meeting. It works at a supermarket. It works everywhere. It's just teaching good citizenship and, you know, being aware of people and their feelings. And, you know, doesn't matter. All people have feelings. We have to do, you know, justice by everyone. And it's like a teaching one-on-one class. All these things are in there. Teachers do this all the time. Thank you. Uh, one unique thing that I found, though, it's not it's not anything new today because we have uh, we encourage uh, we encourage learning world languages. I did notice one one of the items in here was to try to learn and use some words in the heritage language of students in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> doesn't mean teach the whole class in another language, although we do have, we do have programs for, for those who want to choose that. But why, why wouldn't you want to learn some keywords in another language? It's a great, it's a great skill to have. Um, ensure that bulletin boards and displays and instructional materials uh, cover a wide range of students that kids don't all look alike in there. Of course, you know, of course, again, that is good educational practice. And when we do those things, it reflects, it reflects equity. So while I know there have been heated curriculum disputes in, in other places about where people are trying to go with, um, where people are trying to go with, some of these uh, diversity initiatives, I would, I would point to ours and say that we're saying do good educational practice like we've been doing and equity is embedded into it. And I, I think the whatever hot controversial item someone might be looking for, I, I don't think you would find it here. I think you'd find good teaching of kids here. Um, any any questions or any, anything else by committee members or questions by other other board members? I think that was well said, Andrew. Thank you. All right. Yeah, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I really appreciate the way that you framed that up. I was in the room, obviously not a part of the committee, but listening to the presentation. And I, I think you captured that and summarized it very well. Thank you. I got, at that point, then, if there's nothing, no other questions, that would conclude the committee report. Thank you. I think Laura has something here. Oh, I don't I'm sorry. I, I don't can't see, I can't yeah, see no, the no, hand no problem. very well. So. Yeah, no, no problem. I just, I was letting you finish and then I saw her hand go up. I, I just want to add my voice to this in that, the, the, as you said, Andrew, the, the presentation was excellent. And I really, um, I was in the room too and, and got to uh, see it. And um, there's quite, there were a lot of staff members involved and they did a great job. And I think your synopsis is right on, um, right on point. And I really appreciate you summarizing it that way. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, anybody else? Okay, that concludes the committee report. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. All right, moving on operations uh, report and that will be from the committee chair, Don Smith. Thank you, Eric. Um, operations committee met the third Monday in December and we had three agenda items. First, we got an update on our utilities which are projected to increase $380,000 this year due to the rising costs of natural gas which will have to be absorbed into our existing budget. Um, Chad Jensema showed up and gave us a presentation uh, 
yearly review on transportation. He walked through um, our transportation resources for student, lamers, city metro, and the district vans. Talked a little bit about the bus driver shortage, what our vendors are doing um, in attempts to correct that. Um, he spoke about the issues we were having with the um, afternoon athletics in fall, but he said things seem to be going better recently. And he also shared that there is a parent app, my bus stop app, that parents can use to check on the progress of their students' bus routes. And then um, Mike Stangle came with his yearly enrollment projection report. It's a very large book. It is attached. I'm not gonna go into great detail. Um, if you've been watching this year over year, it's been pretty consistent. And um, within 10 years, we are projected to be under capacity at all our schools. Birth rates and birth rates in um, the city are declining. And yeah, and we are in the state and we're seeing that um, we're going to see that across all our schools. Right now, I believe, based on the numbers Mike shared with us, it's more prevalent in our West Side schools. But with that 10-year projection, and um, we did talk a little bit about accuracy of previous years. And um, 2016, there was a blip. But otherwise, um, those numbers have been pretty accurate. So we are looking at all of our schools being under capacity in 10 years. And um, the projection book is attached to the board docs. So if anybody wants to go in and look at what he shared, there's a lot of numbers and a lot of information in there. Um, but that's what was there for our meeting. Any questions? Did you say utilities 380,000? Yes. All right, any uh, questions for Don or the operations committee? All right, thank you, Don. Thank you. All right, moving on, policy and governance committee, and I will hand that over to committee chair, Laura Leighton Warren. Actually, I said that. Oh, okay. Then I'll hand it over to Laura McCoy. Um, so I chaired this committee um, meeting and um, on December 20th, we had two things on our agenda. Um, the first one was uh, intradistrict inter transfers, which we just discussed. So um, we, we have, uh, we've already voted on that so, and discussed that. And the other one was the dress code, um, the dress code survey. And uh, we had a, a fairly lengthy discussion about what to do about that. Um, and after a certain amount of time, it became clear that we were going to need to have this discussion as a whole board. We, we weren't able to come to really any consensus and Melissa sort of um, helped us through that and, and said that she would propose some things. And so basically, we're going to talk about it later on the agenda for tonight. And I think that was probably the best solution. Um, and anyone have any questions? Okay, right. that completes my report. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, moving on to number six, uh, under discussion, staff pandemic support. Um, so this stems from our last board meeting where the board uh, provided, uh, asked uh, Steve and his team to gather some feedback around uh, supporting our staff through the pandemic. And so uh, I believe there's uh, an attached presentation. I'll hand it over to Steve. All right, uh, and Josh, you want to cue that deck up for me? There we go. Uh, so this is a place to start the conversation. Uh, and what we did was, uh, if uh, you drop down to that second slide, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was couch this in the strategic roadmap that the board has set for the district. 
that includes our mission statement, which we read earlier tonight, our core values, our vision, and our strategic direction. Uh, and uh, that helps frame the work that we do as a district. Uh, the next slide, uh, given the short turnaround time, we had the survey open from December 17th to the 23rd. We mailed that out to all the staff. Uh, we had approximately 1,030 responses. Uh, there were a few duplicates in there, but essentially this is uh, approximately 50% of our certified staff in the district. Uh, I'm not going to read through each of these, but I'm going to tell you that um, we had several major themes that came up uh, as we sought to qualitatively, qualitatively code uh, the data. Uh, one of them has to do with time management, and that is how am I managing the time during the day uh, when I'm at work. Uh, another category had to deal with time off, and that is away from work. Uh, and then on the next slide, uh, workload, and that pertains to how much I'm being asked to do when I'm at work every day. Uh, the next one is about substitute staff. That's what happens when I'm away from work. Uh, and then uh, the next slide, uh, wellness, uh, and that's both uh, physical and social, emotional, and mental health uh, all combined together there. Uh, there was input uh, regarding compensation. And then finally, the last one was some of the challenges that uh, we're facing in the classroom with student behaviors. Uh, so again, not going through all of those in detail for you, but really just sharing the, those large buckets in terms of uh, the areas that we received input from staff. And I think reflecting some of the major concerns that we see that have arisen, not just this year, but over the course of the entire pandemic. <clears throat> Uh, I did want to uh, just share some information, again, won't go over this in detail, uh, in terms of responsiveness to some of the concerns. Uh, so none of this uh, essentially was new news to us as the administrative team, uh, things that we have been aware of and have attempted to focus on, uh, especially at the start of the school year. So one of the things that I did after those qualitative uh, categories came in was I reached out to the administrative team and said, given that these are concerns that have been shared with us by staff, what is your perception of work that you've done in these areas to provide some relief uh, to our staff uh, where you can see some of these things in action? So as you go through each of those categories, time management, the next slides on workload, substitute staff and wellness, uh, you'll see uh, the approaches that were taken. And then that last one uh, in terms of student behavior, uh, some of the things that we've been working on to try to uh, provide assistance to staff there. The last slide I have for you uh, is just an opportunity for me to share some of the challenges that we have in meeting some of the expectations. Uh, obviously, uh, budget being a key one for us, trying to make sure that we maintain a balanced budget as we finish out this school year and as we move into the next year. Uh, you know, uh, it's been hard to miss. There's a national labor shortage out there, uh, pertains to everything from our school nurses and uh, our uh, nurses rather to our school staff uh, with substitute teachers. Uh, and then uh, just a reminder uh, that we do have access uh, through DPI waivers to some uh, flexibility. It is significantly less than the flexibility granted to us through those waivers last year. Uh, but nonetheless, that flexibility still exists for us to consider. Uh, we did have a meeting with DPI, uh, both as the Big Five and CESA last week. They reminded us that uh, we literally uh, have up until the end of the school year to request any of those waivers. So if there is, are things that the board wants to pursue as we move forward, we've got quite a bit of time to consider that. So again, I didn't want to read the deck to you, but I just wanted to let you know what we heard from staff. I, I'll also uh, maybe just uh, give you a perspective. I had a chance to meet with GBEA tonight as part of their rep council assembly. And I talked to them a little bit about the budget. And then after that, I opened the floor up for some Q&A. Many of the themes that you hear uh, in, that are uh, reflected in this survey are things that came forward in the Q&A tonight with GBEA when I met with their team. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, so I'll just frame this up and then open it up to the rest of the board for discussion. Um, but, you know, from where I sit, this is a little bit of a canary in the coal mine kind of thing. Um, and it's really hard to separate pandemic from other problems that we're facing. And certainly in this case, I, I believe that the pandemic is making things worse. However, our shortage will be here long after the effects of, of COVID uh, are gone. And I read an article in Forbes recently called Why Education is About to Reach a Crisis of Epic Proportions. And, uh, you know, there's just some really startling things in there. And I, I, 
I want to first applaud um, our administrative team for taking steps. You know, this isn't like, hey, nothing has been done and we want something to be done. Clearly, we've made steps in that direction. But I guess uh, I, I want to, to proactively start having the conversation. And, and I know no one likes using the words the new normal. But in, in terms of the way education used to be when we post jobs and there's dozens of people who apply, um, when we you know have substitute openings and we have subs to fill those jobs and long-term subs and um, it, it, it's going to continue to put a stress on our system and we need to think differently about um, how we do our work and how we make sure that we have a thriving workforce because at the end of the day um, we can talk about all the different initiatives and things that we want to do in education but if we don't have high quality educators in front of our kids none of that matters. So um, we're not posted for any action here today, but certainly this discussion will go a long ways in, in directing what the next steps are. And I guess I would just be curious as to uh, the thoughts of the rest of the board. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, Steve, I was wondering, like, you know how you have that all time management as the first one. Was there any one or two or three that stood out more like, you know, out of the thousand people? Was there, were there a couple that were just you know, mentioned by almost everybody. So when you, uh, if you, well, actually you don't have to bring that back up, Josh, everybody has it in front of them and I can just talk about it. Um, so when you look at the time management one, uh, there is a couple that stand out. Uh, the first bullet talks about professional development. So just a reminder, we have a couple of different formats for professional development. Uh, one is some full days that we have available to us, think before and after school. Uh, and then we also have uh, early release days um, where there's professional development provided to teachers. Uh, and there was, uh, I would say, if you wanted to look at where there might have been themes, Nancy, or some weight to it, uh, it was uh, focused on the uh, early release days uh, and that professional development time that exists in the afternoon uh, and what, that, what else that time could be used for. Uh, and then uh, you see that actually reflected then in the third bullet where it says make early release work days. So that goes kind of hand in hand with that uh, PD uh, uh, obligation and where that fits together. Uh, and then I, um, I think that one, two, one, two, three, fourth bullet on uh, allowing staff to flex time uh, is uh, also received uh, attention there in terms of uh, how does your workday look and, and how do you uh, put the time in class and then the other time that you have uh, in your uh, regular workday. So time management was like probably one of the most requested. Yes, we did get a lot of input on that. One other thing I want to just jump in on my comments. I know I talked for a while. I'll stop after this, but I just want to also point out if we talk about teachers so often, but this applies to everyone that works in our district. This is facilities, this is specialists, and this is administrators. I don't believe that there's anybody who's thriving. Um, I believe everybody is doing the extra, going the extra mile, trying to balance struggles uh, in their personal and professional lives. This is stressing out our entire system. And, um, you know, we sent this out and I don't know if it went to everybody in our district or just our, our certified teaching staff, but as we think about what it means to be a quality employer and how we retain our people, um, to me, it applies to every single employee in the Green Bay Public School District. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Also, I think this, this isn't just a new thing, like you said, I mean, this has been going on for years. I mean, and I want to connect it back to what we were talking about with Andrew. I think there's come a time where teachers don't have the time always to do all those things that you know you have to do and you want to do to make those connections, to be able to teach in a well-established, loving classroom, <laughs> because there's too many other things on the plate that have taken that away from our ability to be really good educators. And when you're in a classroom and you know what you want to do, but you go, oh, I have to get that test in. There's some real troubles that we have to start solving in order to even get kids to go back into education. So. 
Go ahead, Laura. Um, first, I want to thank um, all the staff that took the time to do the survey and to share their thoughts and their concerns. 1,030 people, and that's that's a really good percentage. I, I was surprised by that number, but um, also I, requ I requested this agenda item and, and um, Eric agreed that it was time we had this discussion. Um, so I guess I'm gonna start with saying that I, I understand the restrictions that the district is under um, with regard to what is required from DPI. I understand the restrictions about money um, I understand the restrictions, well, not restrictions, but all the COVID chaos that we're dealing with right now and how that impacts what goes on in our classrooms every day. Um, and, and no one knows when that's gonna end. Um, and I understand that it isn't just Green Bay. It's a, nation, it's a nationwide issue. But I gotta say that I, you know, I, I looked at this, um, at this, the results, and I, I couldn't help but saying, you know, I couldn't help but say, I was hoping for more. So, um, so I have some specific questions around that, um, and, and also I want to also I want to just touch on something. I know that there's a lot of staff possibly watching this meeting, and I just want to acknowledge that there hasn't always been in our community, the kind of support from everybody for this, our teachers and our staff. Yes, there's been a lot of good support, but there are, there are people who still want to um, portray teachers in a way that is not accurate. Um, and I just wanna say that if you're watching this and you are a staff member, that I, it, it, that really bothers me. And I've come up against, uh, Personally, like I've had people address, address that to me in ways that I, I find very concerning and disappointing. So I just wanted to say that, but so Steve, I have a question. Um, what, what, have, what can we do to uh, limit assessments for the rest of this year? I would like to see them just stop, paused for the rest of the year. Uh, have we taken any uh, steps to do that? So we have. Uh, I know one of the things that's uh, one of the bullets uh, on the, the workload, uh, staff concern workload uh, item. Uh, there was a, a goal to put in a more uh, robust formative assessment system at the high school level. Uh, there was clear consensus that there just simply wasn't capacity in the system to do it at the time. Uh, we do have, uh, as you noted, we do have some requirements from the federal and the state government for assessments. Uh, and then we have assessments that we uh, provide internally uh, that we use to make data informed uh, decisions as part of that process. So uh, that, that circular, circular cyclical process for uh, curriculum instruction and teaching and learning. So uh, the one thing that uh, I can't answer for you today is whether or not uh, all of the assessments that are still in place are federally or state mandated, and uh, if not, how many are district mandated? I would really like the board to see a list of the ones that are mandated. Um, it would give me a better idea, or give us a better idea of what has to happen and what, what the ones that are optional. Excuse me. Last year, maybe right about this time, didn't they have that on one of the slide decks? You know, I think it was Mr. Miller yes. that had that and it was all listed. Could we just bring that back? I think that's great, except that maybe there's been some movement since then. Um, so there might have been some changes. Um, so. I don't know, but I'd like, I would really like to see that with, you know, a visual on, on what has to happen for the rest, at least for the rest of this year. And then, um, and then frankly, I would just like ask that the rest get paused. That would be my personal ask. Um, I don't know if everyone else agrees with that. So, 
Um, and the, I would apply the same thing to professional development. Um, what, what is the, what has to happen and whatever is um, optional, I would say pause that too until the end of the year. I know that it's easier said than done. I get that. But I feel like we need to act like we're in a crisis. And, um, and if that helps keep our, our teachers and our staff in the game, then, then okay, let's do it. So um, same, I guess I would apply the same thing to any new initiatives. You know, these are the things that drain um, time and energy from our teachers. Um, and, you know, again, that, that's, we're in a crisis, let's act like we're in a crisis and maybe pause those if, we, if possible. But until I can kind of see that in some kind of list or whatever, I, it's hard for me to fully understand, you know, I'm not in the classroom all day long, but I'm sure that um, teachers could definitely say, you know, give us a good idea of, of what, what we can put aside for now and, and what has to, absolutely has to stay. So, um, those are my thoughts for now. I just want to make sure I captured that. So what you're really looking for is in assessments, professional development and initiatives, uh, a separation of those that may be mandated. And if so, is that a federal or a state mandate? And then those that would be discretionary and would be mandated by the district. Yes, so um, assessments, professional development and initiatives. Um, Yes, I, I would agree with all that. And um, I, yeah, I'd like to have a, and also, you know, if there's something that can be done, I feel there's some urgency here. Like, I don't want to put it off for another two months. I would like to see it as, happen as quickly as possible, so. Any other comments or thoughts? Go ahead, Laura. I would like to, um, just share support for what Laura said. I think we, we are in a crisis. And I know um, for me being on the board, you think, oh my gosh, we just had a meeting. And you know, it was a month ago, but, but we have teachers and people going in every single day. And so um, you know, these, are, these are crises that they're dealing with right now. And, and I support um, what you suggested, Laura. I think I've been thinking about this concern or this, this issue or crisis that we're in. And from an organizational perspective, I think um, one of the things that I'm thinking about that as I, I know when I was in a leadership position, while you have, you know, you have your star performers, you have your amazing employees, you have the people that are probably burning out when it's not a pandemic, and then you add this in the mix. And with that happening, you also have, and I, you know, it's just, it's just human nature. It's any organization, you have people that are not doing their part. And so, um, which actually makes the performer's job even more difficult. And so one of the things I think in this discussion that we do have to look at, and sometimes it can happen that we're so desperate for teachers and things that then um, people are not held accountable. I don't know that that's happening in the district. I'm just speaking from an organizational leadership perspective of, of this just happens in organizations. And especially when you're dealing with a shortage. Um, so I wonder if aside from the policy things which we can really only do at the board level, I wonder if there are um, one, some successes that are going on in schools. Are there leaders where it's like, you know, it's not a policy change, but here are the things that we've done in our school to support our teachers and to help reduce their burnout. And here's how I'm able to hold people accountable or people on our team that um, are there referrals for counseling? Are there, are there other things available? But what can we do to support our leaders? Maybe not, not the board, but um, as, a, as a district, what can we do to support um, those leaders? And not saying that's not done already, but just, just thinking about this as a, as a larger issue um, because policy, we're looking at some big things, but also as it trickles down, how do we find the success stories? How do we, um, and I know a lot of principals already network with each other, but is there another way that um, professional development, are there any 
principals or other leaders that need professional development or mentoring or just peer coaching, even if they've been professionals for 20 years, you can always learn something. To, and uh, is there something there that we can continue to do to support them as a district as they handle some of the challenges, as they uh, reward the employees that are stepping in and always filling in for other teachers, things like that. So I think looking at a huge policy level, but then also looking down to the pockets of excellence within the district where they're finding really creative ways to help their staff on that day-to-day -day, um, trials and tribulations of, of working through this pandemic. So those are just some of the things that, that came to mind is because there's employee human things that no matter what the organization is, that they're just, they just happen. Um, and then, Oh, just looking at how do we, how do we become an employer of choice? I know it's, it's is different, you know, I'm used to working in, um, in the profit world, but um, I think compensation is an important thing. And I know there were some creative ways that people came up with compensation for other districts, but how do we reward those performers that are constantly picking up? And, and maybe that's more incentive for some that, that aren't to maybe um, step up. And I, I know that's a whole um, bucket of worms. Um, you know, with tax dollars and everything, but is there something that we can do with that? And um, I think that's it. And I just want to—I I just appreciate all the work that's been done, and I—I I, uh, completely agree. This is a crisis, and we have to—we have to keep those good, good teachers and um, bring other good teachers to our district if we can, and 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 support one another. So, thank you. So I just I want to play devil's advocate for a second uh, with the, the full acknowledgement that I'm in total agreement. And again, my comments earlier about the crisis and making sure that we retain our people. However, when I look at things like assessment, professional development, new initiatives, the other side of this is student achievement, right? I mean, we've, we, we know that there's areas that our, our district is, uh, needs to improve in, and there's... Uh, people in our district whose entire job it is to, to be held accountable for those, right? All the, all the way going up to Steve saying, hey, we need to make sure our kids are literate. We need to make sure that, that they're prepared for success academically, um, in addition to social, emotionally, and, and, and everything that it takes to, to help prepare our kids for life after they leave our district. Um, so if in six months or a year, we get our you know, our results back and somebody says, hey, your district is not cutting it. Your kids aren't reading where they're supposed to. Your kids aren't, uh, you know, prepared as they should be. Um, we're going to ask those people to come in front of us and say, hey, why, why is this? Why, why aren't we doing it? And they're going to say, well, we would have had better data and we, we cut out assessments and we would have trained our teachers on uh, this new thing, but we stopped professional development. And there's a, a new curriculum that we feel would have helped us, but we stopped doing that, right? So everything on that list, is it, it's not fun. It's not exciting. It's not the part that kids love when they come to school every day. But ultimately, it's the science behind what we do as a school district. And so, again, I'm, I, I, I want to acknowledge the double-sided, uh, double, two sides of that argument to say, yes, and. Um, so I just don't want that to get lost for us to say, hey, cut out all the academics. Don't teach anything. Just bring the kids in. Put your arms around them. Do social emotional learning because we are in a crisis that's also gonna have consequences down the road. And so I just wanna make sure that we're not losing that, um, that we need to address this crisis because at the end of the day, not having enough staff in our classroom is a non-starter, right? You, you can have all the great assessments and professional development if you don't have people to implement it. Um, so I just wanna make sure that that comment gets out there too, that it's not, these are all bad things and let's stop doing them. Um, so go ahead. I totally understand what you're saying, um, but we're not, you know, we're not asking teachers to to stop teaching. We're just basically lightening the load temporarily. Um, you know, I think everyone understands that, you know, once this pandemic is has passed, that um, you know that all the things that districts around this country have had to do just to survive 
and keep their thrive their workforce thriving in any way they can um that will you know change back to whatever normal looks like so and to kind of um to kind of support that i just want to read a little bit of a um a letter we got uh recently from a person in our district um just gonna do a small quote here i write this letter to you today as a teacher parent and taxpayer in green bay area public school district it is my hope that i can be candid and honest without any repercussions to my teaching role to be entirely honest with you i am exhausted i feel i can speak for myself and many of my colleagues when i say we just can't keep this pace up much longer the letter is lengthy there's a lot of it's an excellent letter but that kind of that is um that example is something that we've heard many times recently and well let's just be honest in the last couple of years from our teaching staff and other staff members as well so um i just want to put that out there i feel like this again would be a temporary thing but if it keeps our our staff you know able to keep their heads above water and to, to see our kids through the end of the school year i feel strongly that we should do it I, I agree with that. And, and I think, Laura, it's been more than just a couple years where teachers have been talking about the workload and the unnecessary assessments they feel that they're giving. And yes, truly, there is a scientific part to teaching. It's necessary. But if you ask me, there's an art to teaching as well. And I think we've totally destroyed that part. And, and like when we were talking about all those things, what you do, if you have can you put bulletin boards up if you have time? There's so much time testing. It, it takes more than what you can even imagine. Okay, I mean, I know when I was there, but I also still have friends who are teaching and they tell me how much time it takes to do one test. And then what does that do to the child? There comes a time when there is too much testing. <laughs> even adults don't like to be tested that much. So we have to we have to do some major things. This has been going on for a long time. Right now, the teachers need to do be assessing where their students are right now, make small term objectives so that they can feel success. And if you think beforehand in a regular classroom that there was like a spread of three years, they say for sure. Well, that spread just got a lot better, bigger. So those teachers are all over the place. And then they don't come to school because they have to be in isolation. So then that's another job. And then that's another parent call. And that's, a, it's tremendous what these people are doing. And then if the custodian doesn't come and there's no custodians, then they're cleaning everything themselves as well. So there it's, it's time now to really give them a break of some sort. And, and you all know all the limitations we have and stuff, but I'm asking you to just push that is, to get through the end of this year. And I think they, the scores will go up because teachers will actually be take, teaching each child where they are right now. Thank you. Brenda, Andrew, I wanna make sure that you get a chance. I don't know if you have anything, but I, it's hard for me to call on you. Do either of you have any comments? Yeah, I do. Um, Steve, you mentioned something about the DPI waivers and then made a comment that made it sound as if each district could ask for unique individual waivers or is that um or do the waivers just come for the whole state so those are district by district waivers so it's not unlike what we had last year there's a uh, not quite the breadth that we had last year in terms of access to those waivers but they look very similar um, just for example, one of the things that's in the, uh, the slide deck uh, is a concern about the, the role of the educator effectiveness program. Uh, that is an area where there is an opportunity to apply for a waiver. Um, so that would just be one of those examples. So the menu is a little less extensive than what they provided to us last year, but there are still opportunities for the district uh, to seek uh, exemptions. But it's not, okay, so, so the exemptions we would be seeking are are determined and placed on a list by DPI. 
Is there an opportunity for our district to be unique and ask for a waiver that's not on that list or is it just the list they're providing? We can, uh, and I know through the meetings with the big five that uh, at least a couple of the other districts have asked for things that aren't on the list. Uh, DPI has been good at listening, um, but has not provided access to those requests that have come from the other districts. So certainly okay. something we can ask for, uh, but uh, they may come back and tell us that we have an adequate uh, set of options. And so, um... I know you've been working on this for uh, your team has been working on this for a while and you've given us a good list of the things that you've done so far. Are you still um, moving forward? Um, is your team still willing to consider more things? Are they still going to continue working on this? Um, I, I like Laura's, uh, Leighton and Warren's idea of just seeing if there are things that have been working in other schools. Um, I don't know if there's the ability to give, um, I, this is a very generic statement because I don't have any examples in mind, but to give principals a little bit of flexibility um, to, relie to relieve stress where, there's, where they see it happening in their schools um, um, or, uh, I, I guess I just um, want to know as we move forward that that there's the team is still working. I know we uh, the the email that Laura quoted from was incredibly filled or filled with in, you know incredible numbers of examples of where there is stress. Um, and I would hope that your team would go back. And I think actually you did respond to that person and say that your team would go back and, and look at some of her examples and, and try to see if we can um, help in, in more ways than we already have. Yes, certainly that's uh, essentially part of our ongoing process. So, uh, and especially uh, Laura, some of the suggestions you made. Um, so we do have our principals in uh, collaborative groups, uh, much like uh, professional learning communities that you see uh, out at the school level. Uh, and I, I don't know uh, to what extent they've talked about um, those areas of success that they've had in their individual buildings. We can certainly create room for them to do that. Uh, and then uh, I think our staff, our team is always open to uh, input feedback from the board and from the, the, uh, the staff uh, as they look for ways to make sure that we are uh, both effective uh, in the instruction that we provide, but also responsive to the staff who provide that instruction. Yeah, because I, I, I just feel like this is a, I mean, we, we never know what's around the corner two weeks from now in terms of changes that might be made. Um, and so I do think that being flexible and continuing to look for ways of release, releasing some of those pressure points on our staff and our teachers would be helpful. Andrew, go ahead. Um, thank you. I have a... Um... I have a couple of um, couple of questions, and then I'll have um, I'll have comments as well. Um, I know it was mentioned in there that there's a rotation of of district staff subbing in buildings, and I'm wondering approximately how many on a given day would be in the buildings, and have we leveraged uh, central office staff? in any cases to be able to, or are we prioritizing them to save buildings from having to go virtual? And have we, have we been able to do that with central office staff? And if, if we haven't, um, you know, why, um, why couldn't we do more, I guess? And I, I'm saying that not knowing what you're gonna tell me the answer is, but I guess I'd like to ask that first about how many district staff are in buildings typically. So that's a great question, Andrew. So essentially what we do each day is we take a look at the number of absences in a building, uh, and then we look at the fill rate. So we know that uh, we have a great cadre of uh, guest teachers, substitute teachers in the district, and they'll go out and pick up uh, openings that are out there. And then after they've done that, then we can see what the net fill rate looks like, and we can target those hotspots. And right now we're... Uh, uh, we're sending out uh, all of the uh, certified staff uh, in the, the district office 
uh, to get out there and uh, provide that relief. Uh, so I'll uh, just uh, uh, call out uh, the work that's being done by special education, Claudia Hendrickson and her team. Um, we've got an enormous shortage right now of both teachers and paraprofessionals in our special ed program. And so they go through, they look at those gaps and then uh, they're doing triage on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some of those assignments are multi-day. For instance, if somebody goes out uh, and they've got to be out on isolation or quarantine and they may be out uh, for a period of time, uh, they may assign a staff member to that particular classroom for the length of that absence. And some of that has to do with the fact that we want to make sure that there's consistency for the teachers, or I'm sorry, for the students by uh, putting the same teacher in front of them on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, but right now, if, if you came here during the day, uh, if you walked through the teaching learning department uh, or our special education department in particular, because they tend to be those departments that have the largest number of certified staff uh, here at the district office building, um, you'd find that those uh, departments are essentially uh, empty uh, here because those staff are out in the buildings uh, covering classrooms for uh, teachers. And then uh, it goes beyond our certified staff. Um, and maybe I'll just call out our, our family advocates. Uh, so those folks are out filling uh, support roles uh, in the buildings. Uh, and then I think the last group I'd call out is our secretarial staff. So uh, we've got a lot of folks here at the building who are out uh, answering phones and, and sitting at front desks in schools uh, covering those spaces too. So we're trying to get as creative as we can, making sure that uh, the folks here uh, are out in the building providing that support. Um, and in some cases, they may be able to do a little bit of double duty and do some of their work uh, from down here while they're out there. Uh, but uh, really making sure that first and foremost, we're meeting the needs of the teachers. Okay, so what do you say it's a, it's a majority of, uh, on any given day, a majority of staff eligible to do so, including, including into the administrative ranks or going in buildings? Absolutely. I, I can tell you that from this morning, uh, we had a meeting uh, to start the day uh, and quite a few of the administrators that were part of that meeting were actually already out in buildings um, covering for principals and others who are absent right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess one, one thing that I would be interested in looking at, and on, on the one hand, it, ha it has a lot of symbolic value, and I, I don't know, it, it doesn't change the overall workload that much but uh right after right after act 10 the uh the district uh unilaterally just added a half hour to the the work day just changed the and, and don't get me wrong e everyone knows that whether it was 37 and a half or whether it was 40 or whether you said it was 42 or 45, whatever number that is, the average teacher is putting in a lot more work than that many hours. And we, we know that. But that arbitrary change from, from 37 and a half to 40, uh, done, who knows why? I guess it was, it was Act 10 and there were no, uh, no restrictions on that. So it was just done and it's been there forever. Um, I think that could be a place to... I think that could be a place to look again. It does it mean that does it mean that our teaching staff are you know going to suddenly be working less than forty? No, of course not. We know it's well over forty. But what it does do is it provides a little bit of flexibility, perhaps as to when. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that's been talked about that I've heard about from different administrations since at least Act Ten was we're going to. We're going to, although there's more, although we have more control over the workday, we're also going to treat um, treat salaried staff like salaried staff. Um, I am not aware of that many changes in those regards. I, I don't believe, and I, uh, I would be really happy to be wrong on this one, but I don't think I am. I, I don't think there's a very easy way for an elementary teacher to and i'm not saying every day but an elementary teacher to change their schedule to one day to one time meet a friend for lunch i don't think they could do that without uh, taking a personal day uh, because of the way that i mean not realistically i don't mean join their friend join them in the you know parking lot for 29 minutes um you know things like you know, things like asking to, I, I just don't think that that salaried flexibility 
that was talked about as a uh, um, kind of to soften the blow of Act 10. I don't think it ever really happened that much, especially at elementary. I, I would like to see that looked into in addition to the half hour. Um, the other thing, you know, when we talk about these requirements and I, I think it is real important to, to make this clear. Have I, have I heard from teachers that were over testing kids? Yep. And even before COVID, uh, we, we, I would assume many of us have, have heard that that we're over testing that we're uh, over meeting, although maybe a little bit better with that, but still a lot of meeting time. Uh, here's what I've heard no teacher ever complained to me about is, hey, my day with the kids is too long. Hey, I just want to get, I just want to get home and, um, you know, not, not be like, no one is saying there's too much kid time. And I think that's something that probably, uh, large chunk of people can get behind as we teachers want to be able to focus their times on kids and nancy knows that nancy's seen over the years how gradually over many years kid time has been replaced or meaningful kid time has been replaced by testing time i would go as i would go a step further i like working within the rules if we can to to reduce testing i i would I would be so bold as to take it a step further. And if we're not getting the accommodations we need, if we talk to our practitioners, which ones of these tests really have meaning for you and value for you in the classroom and which ones are we doing just to fill some re external requirement imposed on us, I'd be interested in knowing what's the penalty if we defy a mandate once or twice. Now, Granted, I know that there are many things where to defy a mandate could risk serious funding or something, and then we shouldn't defy those mandates, obviously. But I would not be surprised if there's things out there, maybe that our staff, our, our teachers tell us aren't useful to them in the classroom, and maybe we find out there's no penalty if we just, uh, if we just didn't do them. Some there would be, some there might not be. I don't know. Maybe there's, maybe they all carry penalties now. If they do, then my question, my question here is moot. If they all carry severe penalties, but I would like to, I'd like to see that too. Um, it's, I do appreciate that there has been some flexibility by DPI, but whatever flexibility there is and whatever flexibility is being used, we're still hearing teachers saying that they are spending spending way, way too much time uh, testing kids. And I, I guess I would be interested in looking at, um, you know, is there something, if there, is there something we need to look at as far as meeting time um, as well? Uh, I believe that is, I I, I do I do appreciate hearing the amount of uh, central office staff that's in in buildings. I I was prepared to be you know pleasantly you know pretty happy with hearing a, a third are out in buildings and to hear it's a majority and some departments are almost everyone in buildings. That's the all hands on deck approach that that we need and because that's what what's nothing's more. The work downtown is important, but nothing's more important than you know, having kids have teachers and having buildings not have to go, um, having fewer buildings, hopefully be able to, more buildings be able to avoid virtual. Um, thank you. Yeah. Let's go, John, Nancy. Steve, we have two early release dates yet this year. We do the uh, professional development in the afternoons after the students are gone. I would be interested to see, I would be interested to see the feasibility of making those work days. And I know one of them is coming up quickly at the end of January. And I agree with Andrew on eliminating that half hour. Um, I think it's more symbolic. My understanding of that half hour is that's time that teachers need to be at the school site. I, I don't think that work 
will stop if we eliminate that hour, but I do think it would be a huge increase in teacher morale. That's something that was taken away in 2010. And it's something if it is feasible that we could give back, I think would have would be a huge morale and emotional boost for our teachers. So I'd be interested in the feasibility of that. Um, yeah, I guess those, I'm looking at things that we can do quickly. I, I would like to see us take action quickly. And if that means a special board meeting, I would prefer not to wait a month if possible. Go ahead, Nancy. Say about that half hour. But what I wanted to ask about that is when they put that half hour in, it didn't add to the student time, the teaching time. So it's not connected because I heard that, you know, as a district, we are we have to watch how many minutes we have to have. But if that's not included in that, then then that would be helpful. So I'll add uh one piece, I, I just pulled up a presentation that I gave in a previous role that I held where I was presenting ironically to a, our school board. Um, and I did some research into length of school day. So this data could be a little bit old, but uh, the Green Bay School District has the shortest student school day of any district in our area by as much as 45 minutes compared to other districts. Um, and to Andrew's point, I've never heard a single teacher say, I've got too much face time with my kids. It's, it's you know, and that's elementary, I should share, uh, elementary school day. So, you know, that's probably not something that we can modify here, you know, the length of the school day and the schedule and the busing and all of that. But as a long-term systematic problem, more time for our teachers to spend in front of their kids is a good thing. Um, so Steve, I guess, you're hearing everything that I'm hearing, but if I had to summarize this uh, for the rest of the board is that uh, we applaud everything that uh, your team has done to try to acknowledge the crisis that we're in. And we want uh, to the full capacity that you're able and can effectively implement something this year. Um, if it is something that you feel takes uh, board action, we would schedule a special meeting if we needed to, or if it was something that took your team time to implement and had to wait till February. And if there's anything that doesn't take board initiative, uh, you have, it sounds like unanimous and full support of the board to um, take any of those actions. And I think I've got enough information that you've all shared with me that I've got some consensus ideas in here. Um, so we'll start working on that tomorrow. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, let's move on then um, to WASB proposed 2022 resolutions. And I think I'm handing that over to Laura McCoy. I just wanted to do just a couple minutes on this. Uh, so our, our state uh, WASB convention is coming up um, in a couple weeks. And uh, one of the rules I, I've had for the last few years is to, as a delegate, at this uh, at the resolution um, at the assembly, and um, you guys have all seen there's an attached list of all the resolutions that are being proposed, and I just wanted you guys to see them, um, and I don't know exactly how I'm gonna. Oftentimes they're amended on on the spot during the assembly, so I can't um, promise you that they're going to be in this form when when the vote happens but um, I will be representing our district at this assembly on these resolutions. Does anyone have any questions? Brenda? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, Brenda. That's okay. Um, Laura, are you, will you plan then to um, present next month after the convention and just let us know which one of these was amended so that it doesn't look like itself anymore and which ones um, were voted on as is. <clears throat> sure, Brenda, I, I would suspect that once the, the, they're finalized, um, yes or no, or whatever amendments are made that the, they'll put it on their website, but I can definitely um, you know, circle back and, and let you know how things went. It, um, more, I'm, I'm mostly interested in just because um, we can read all the, the resolutions and 
Mm-hmm. You know, as you, as you know, from doing this for a few years, most of them go through pretty much unchanged, you know, they might add a little phrase, but I would be most interested just in hearing your, your perception and um, what happened with, with any of the resolutions that had a huge amount of discussion and maybe were amended um, significantly during the process. Cause when the book comes out, it's hard to go back. I mean, you, you kind of miss that part of the process. Yeah. The process in the room when this happens is pretty interesting and, mm-hmm. and sometimes has some very unexpected turns and you get to see representation from pretty much all the school districts in the state. So these are your cohorts and you know who are doing the same work as uh, as our school board does, but they you you're never quite sure exactly what 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 they're going to do. Um, and uh, sometimes it's uh, a little bit surprising. So anyway, um, sure, I can definitely do that. All right, any other questions on this process? Otherwise uh, we'll get an update next month on how it all plays out. Go ahead, Laura. Just a comment, I, I, in reviewing it, I really like to see that there was the um, Asian American Pacific Islander professional development and training that's going to be happening. I think that's long overdue. Um, I know um, working at the casino, we had a lot of Hmong employees, Hmong customers, and it seemed they, they faced a lot of, I mean, this was a while ago, but they faced a lot of discrimination and racism from people that had no, no clue of why they were here and that they were our ally during um, the Vietnam War. And I think this kids need this history in school, teachers need this history. And so I, I just thought that was amazing that I saw that in here and it's like, oh my gosh, yes, why not? So um, I appreciate that coming forward and it's good to see. That particular resolution is one that I think will, is potentially going to have a really interesting discussion. Um, there's a lot of people with very strong feelings about that. And there's, I mean, the resolution as written here talks about uh, the rationale anyway talks about some of the things that um, that population has been going through um, when COVID hit. Um, it, it's, it's, and I've had people um, reach out to me about this, uh, uh, this one specifically. Um, but I just wanna make sure that people understand that these are resolutions that if they pass, basically what happens then is the, um, our lobbyists with WASB basically that gives, that's um, what they will work on on behalf of the school um, districts in the state. And um, it doesn't promise that anything legislatively will happen, but it will be, it will be us setting that um, those priorities for them. All right, any other comments, questions? All right, moving on then uh, to our action item section. Uh, item A is isolation of district students and staff for COVID-19. Uh, I'll hand this over to Steve and then anyone else who's gonna speak on the topic. All right, uh, so uh, we have a new isolation chart that we're recommending uh, and you'll see linked in the public comment section there uh, is the uh, CDC uh, updates. Uh, and you can see in there that uh, one of the things that they are recommending is something that we've seen take place uh, kind of in the general public and across other employment sectors over the last week. And that's a move to a five day uh, isolation period uh, for students and staff. Uh, and so as you look through the, uh, uh, the chart that we've attached, um, you'll see that uh, when uh, students are asymptomatic um, with a co- positive COVID test, uh, that we've got a set of recommendations in there uh, that uh, on day six, you'll note if no symptoms develop, uh, a staff or student may return to work or school uh, for day six to 10, uh, they would need to continue to wear a mask. Um, for us in the district, that's not a challenge because we've got a, a mask requirement in place. Uh, if they're symptomatic, uh, you'll note that, uh, again, uh, that day zero is the day those symptoms start. Um, they were asking them to stay home uh, and isolate, get a COVID test. Uh, and if they have a negative PCR test, uh, then they're not required to isolate. Um, and then again, on day six, if the symptoms are resolving, they've got no fever. Uh, they may return to work, uh, and if not, they continue to isolate 
Uh, so essentially what we're doing now is rather than um, that longer period of time that we've been using for isolation, um, we're recommending that uh, that time frame be shortened to five days. Uh, we did reach out to our area healthcare providers. Uh, one of the things that they immediately responded with was this was the practice that they have now adopted for themselves, uh, for their staff. So similar practice uh, taking place in the healthcare field right now. So we feel that um, it'll work well here. And then maybe a reminder for you that when we went back and looked at the data, that we're not seeing significant spread in school. Most of the issues that we're dealing with are coming from outside of school. So whether it's student or staff, they're having interactions with others away from school, uh, and that's where they're having exposures. Um, and uh, probably, although I wouldn't like to necessarily uh, assert cause and effect, um, but I do know from talking to our healthcare providers that um, certainly the mitigation factors that we have in place right now, which include masking, physical distancing, uh, HVAC, and hand washing, are making an enormous difference inside school. All right, um, any questions or comments um, for Steve and or about the topic in general? Go ahead, Brenda. Um, does, so this, uh, the new chart that, you, that you've provided for us today, does this merge with the previous one? Because they don't, bo they, they both have different situations in them, I think. So I think one of the challenges that we have is that uh, what we're currently looking at is a change to our isolation, on, which is, uh, again, if you look at the isolation chart, um, got a positive uh, uh, test uh, and you're either uh, asymptomatic or symptomatic. And uh, so from that standpoint, uh, that's different than quarantining, which is the exposure. Uh, working with our health team, they are interested in looking at and making some uh, recommendations for revisions to the quarantining procedures, but right now we would maintain those as they are. Uh, and that has to deal with those close contacts because again, remember that uh, our quarantining procedures are essentially related to close contacts that happen off school property. Uh, so those are things that are happening either at home or in the community. Yeah, okay, so so I guess I maybe I didn't phrase my question well. So this isolation protocol and our quarantine protocol that are both attached are what we will use moving forward. Correct, sorry, I didn't. I wasn't clear on my end either. We added the quarantine piece just so that you were reminded of what is in place. Um, what we are recommending to change is the isolation chart, which is attached. So you have two charts, one for isolation, one for quarantining. The one we're asking for the motion for changing is on isolation. Quarantine is status quo at this point in time and being reviewed by the health team. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sorry if that's clear as mud. If you've got any other questions about that, let me know. Sorry. Um, um, no, sorry. sorry, we'll I'm go sorry. to Laura and then we'll go to Andrew. Um, to, uh, one of the things that I've been hearing and I'm sure the rest of you have as well is a concern from staff members about um, uh, what happens on day six when it says uh, that they must uh, continue to wear a wealth fitted face covering. Um, I've been hearing, and I don't know if the rest of you have too, that, that the, the enforcement of mask wearing and well-fitted mask um, is, uh, isn't consistent. Um, and I, I, I'm really uncomfortable with this uh, proposal generally. So um, if I were gonna vote yes on this, I would need to I mean, what can we do to strengthen or at least revisit or um, recommit to mask wearing, um, solid mask wearing and enforce it uh, across the board? So one of the things that uh, we also heard from our area healthcare providers was a recommendation that we move away from cloth masks. So you'll see today I'm no longer supporting my mm -hmm. district colors, which I usually do. Uh, and I'm wearing the the plain generic surgical mask because uh, that's what they're recommending that uh, we move to. Uh, so worked with uh, uh, Jake, uh, who you met from procurement. Uh, he's currently working on a significantly large order of both adult and more importantly, probably Laura to your point, uh, the youth masks. So look like this, but obviously fit a smaller face. Um, so we will have those available. Uh, many are available right now, we'll have more available shortly. 
uh, that'll be deployed in the schools. Um, we won't require it, but we are uh, recommending uh, that people switch from the cloth mask to the surgical mask. Uh, and we should have enough on hand to provide those uh, to students and staff who may not have access to them on their own. And perhaps just one more note is uh, Chad would, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind everybody that Chad would tell you that um, we have them on the bus. So if you're a child and you get on the bus and you didn't happen to remember to bring a mask with you, those are available immediately upon entry into the bus. Um, so I was wondering if we could hear from Kristen, Kristen Johnson, kind of her take on this. Hi, thank you. Um, I am in agreement with it. I think it would be a good idea. Um, most people are feeling quite well, what we're finding with this new strain, even within three to four days. Um, one thing that, you know, we do know is a challenge in town right now is getting tests. Um, we're struggling to get people in in even four to five days. So, you know, really by the time we even know they're positive, they're almost going to be able to come back already that quickly. Um, but people are feeling good quickly. It seems like there's one of two extremes, either they're, they're not or they are. So symptoms are much more mild with the current strain that's going on, um, but certainly more contagious. We are seeing a lot of families um, or people that were at large gatherings that were positive. That's kind of what we're, we're seeing since the post-holiday rush. Thank you. Right. Andrew, do you wanna go next? Yes, I guess I'm, you know, I'm glad to see that, um, you know, in, in accordance with the direction the CDC is going in and the, the changes with the new variant and thank goodness the uh, lower severity of, of illness, generally speaking, that we are shortening the quarantine period, but I, uh, the isolation period, but I need to go back to the, the quarantine because the, the quarantine is what can, the quarantine is what can make you lose you know, 20 days and it's, and it's still 20 days. And if we don't do anything tonight or call a special meeting, then it's going to be a month before we could even try to, to change that. And, you know, I'm getting people with the real um, legitimate concern about how odd it is that if you get COVID, you can be back in, in school in days if you start feeling better and you could still we have certain categories of people who are stuck out for 20 days because someone in their house had it um the the data is showing that the contagion period i believe is is shorter with the the new variant and well i'm sure there are some outlier cases that occasionally it could take so long for you to develop covid from the close contact I'm concerned right now that there are people as things are changing that are, you know, would be in a, in a worse condition, not having COVID than having COVID. I think one comment that I'd like to make with that in our dashboard does a great job and Josh is able to pull some really wonderful data for us is this is our first experience with this new variant. I mean, we did not have this peak that we had prior to the winter break. It was just getting started. So I guess what I, the reason that we're waiting to look deeply at the longer quarantine periods is it'll be interesting to see is how quickly our family and households testing positive. Is it something that we're seeing later? Because when with the Delta variant, I'll be honest with you, we were seeing many people testing out on day 16, 17, and they were positive. So we need to get that data under our control to see what we're seeing in our community. And I think that's the easiest way to keep us safe. And we're not saying we don't want to look at that because we absolutely do. And we want these kids in school and we want the staff at school. But our data didn't support that from Delta and we have no data yet from this current variant. And I think we need to get a chance to do that. 
So, but we're not we're not waiting for data about the isolation. We're not doing it in a vacuum. We're listening. We're listening to CDC and making changes based on that. Is this does the CDC still have a twenty day quarantine recommendation in certain cases? They have a multitude of levels to what they're recommending for quarantine, including whether you're vaccinated, whether you've had a booster, what vaccine you've had. Um, and we have sat down as a group numerous times to go over that. And it's basically as clear as mud to quote Steve. Um, it's hard to figure out and decipher exactly what is the right thing to do. I'll be completely honest with you. So they're not exactly shortening it, but they are really, really pushing the boosters um, they're really, really pushing the vaccinations in general. And now that these younger kids can be boosted, they're going to be added into that group also. Okay. So are there, and I could be wrong on this, but I thought CDC doesn't have any quarantine categories longer, longer than 10 days. Do they have, I mean, even if we're looking to the strictest one, do they have do they still have a 20 day one? Or, I mean, I'm not even saying take the least restrictive. I'm saying, do they have any that are so restrictive as ours? They do because what they don't call out is household. So you have to read in between the lines of a, the time that you're exposed to someone who's positive and then the time that you are potentially being infectious. So it's still 10 days of quarantine but that doesn't include the 10 days that you're with that person that's positive. So that's one of the reasons that we do want to look at shortening that up, but we need to get more data off of this current variant before we're going to feel really comfortable doing that. Right, but they, they used to have household quarantine recommendations, right? They did have some amount of, they didn't. No, it was not well called out. The only place you could really find it well written was that in the DHS. Okay, I'm just so there. So I'm not I'm not correct that the the CDC has as its most restrictive quarantine to have uh, ten days. That's not correct or it is correct but we're interpreting because of and i'm not saying it's uh, there there yes it does matter that someone could have it and then you could get it delayed from them that that does matter to a point but i again i'm i'm just really worried about these people still missing for you know for for 20 days it's it's really extreme and um and again the the I guess, yes, if you get the positive test, you know that you're not going to be infectious after a certain amount, or you're not likely to be infectious after a certain amount of time, but we're going to have people going going back who are, you know, positive for COVID just a few, a few days ago. I'm also, separately, I'm also worried about what happens with it not being possible to, to get a test, and did we just had we had some discussion about offering uh, testing in the in the buildings? Did we did we do something with that? We are. Um, I can tell you, our nurses to date, just because I ordered the test from Provea, have done almost twelve hundred tests within the buildings, and that has been since uh, November. And we have on-site testing that we have now five days a week. <laughs> and this week alone, he's done forty tests. Well, today was only Monday. Um, he was also there last week, Thursday and Friday, and did 40 tests each of those days. So we have, and we're only doing it to staff, staff's families, students, and student families. So we have hit a huge number that our health providers are struggling with just because of the sheer number of people that are positive right now. I think that's pretty incredible when the amount of tests that our nursing staff and our contact tracers have done. Andrew, I'll jump in here for a second and uh, I'll just share that I uh, went to our district uh, testing site um, 
it was the first appointment I was able to get anywhere in our community. So I'm appreciative that we have that available. Um, it did take uh, four days, five days to get my results back, um, which you know, obviously that that's not on the district that they had to go down to Madison uh, to get the results. So that's difficult. Um, I am, you know, hearing when you look at that 20 days that says, well, if you get a COVID test 16 or after, well, that's tough to do now. So that almost ensures that you're going to be out for those 20 days. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have the what I feel like we've been able to consistently rely on is going off of CDC guidance, right? That as a district, we've been able to say, hey, this, this is what we're gonna hang our hat on. This is, we're not medical experts. That's what we're going to, um, to go off of. And, and I've heard from people with the new uh, five-day isolation period who said, oh, I'm not comfortable with that. I get that. There've been people who've been uncomfortable with other things that we've been doing, but as a, as a board, again, we don't have to do this, but we've said, this is what the CDC says. So if you don't like that, you know, now all of a sudden you're changing and saying, well, I'm not doing what the CDC says, I'm doing what I'm comfortable with. And that, that to me is inconsistent. Um, so that's why I'm in favor of the isolation protocol. And, and you know, that's why that came forward. And, and Steve and his team has said, CDC says this, that's what we're gonna to present to the board because that's how they've consistently been making their decisions. With relation to the unvaccinated asymptomatic, um, you know, and that, that 20 day quarantine, to me, if the CDC is inconsistent, if it's not clear, if we have to read between the lines, um, I appreciate that, that you know, we, we are, you know, trying to look at that and, and make the most conservative decision. But to me, to, to ask a, a student to miss essentially four, you know, three weeks of school, um, not able to get tested on that day 16, I, I would just wonder if we can go back, interpret it in maybe the, not the most restrictive way, but can we say, hey, the CDC also says this, this is another way to interpret it and a way for us to reduce that 20 days because I'm, you know, talking to families who are trying to come at this, you know, and saying, listen, I'm not anti-mask, I'm not anti-vaccine, I understand all of your safety precautions, but keeping my kindergarten home for three weeks with no instruction is, is too detrimental. It's just too detrimental. And so I don't feel like I'm capable of putting together a recommendation here that is aligned with some CDC guidelines for the board to vote on. We do have a special meeting scheduled on the 24th, if that's something that we could ask Heidi and the, and the team to go back and say, here's something else to consider. Technically still within CDC guidelines, maybe not the most restrictive, um, but it, I'm with Andrew that asking uh, a student to stay home for 20 days, knowing that they really can't get tested and get their results back in time on day 16, um, I'd like to see us make some movement on that. If, if somebody, Andrew, I don't know if you're in a different spot and you feel like you could put together a motion um, that was aligned tonight, I would uh, be supportive of that. Otherwise I would look for something to come at another date. That's just well, my take on it. Go ahead. I, I guess I, I, what I keep, and I, I've, been, I've been looking here at the, the CDC, reduced um you know the reduced quarantine and i'm it's 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 pretty comprehensive right there's a lot of there's a lot of frequently asked questions why do you do it does it apply does it apply to k-12 schools yes it does now it didn't initially for several days um right down to the point of saying <clears throat> who's not included in social in shorter isolation and quarantine uh people with severe illness children under two people who cannot wear a mask and people who are immunocompromised so with many many places for the cdc to say that shared households we need to st we still need to be that long they're not they're not saying it or i'm missing it and my my apologies if i'm i'm missing it but to me if if anything um it seems that if you want if you wanted to 
as a most stringent, if you wanted to say, well, for the close house cold contact, we'll take five because they might be contagious for five. And if they gave it to you, you might be contagious for five. Okay, that would be 10. I mean, that is a substantial improvement over 20 if if we did that, right? That would be that would be that would still be double the CDC. I I would think that would be worth worth consideration. That is one of the things we're considering, in all honesty. But then we would have to have a test of negativity for them to come back on that day. But we really need some data coming back from this current variant. And right now we don't have it. We don't even have everybody entered in from the last day. It's the, the positivity rate is phenomenal right now. And I, you know, it, it has to do also with their vaccine status and whether they're vaccinated or not and how long it lasts. And we honestly haven't had time to, we've looked at it, but to sit down and drill down to the nitty gritty We've not done that. The nurses and the contract tracers have been working 12 hour days every day, trying to keep up with us. And we're not in disagreement. It needs to get looked at, but we need to get our data out there to really do a good job of looking at it and do it correctly, including looking at, did they have COVID recently? Have they been vaccinated? What series of vaccine are they on? Because that's all layered out in that guideline. So we're not opposed to looking at it. We just, we need a couple of weeks. Um, I, I don't, I don't think, a, I don't think a motion would pass tonight uh, on this. I, but there, you know, again, the C, so I still am struggling with the, the, us being ready to go to move to the, CDC's recommendation of five days, which I support, despite the fact that we don't have a robust set of a uh, robust set of our own data since the new variant, because that takes time, and we're rightfully spending more time contract contact tracing and getting tests out there and everything. But it's why it's okay for why it's okay for one, but not the other, especially when the other is what's you know, what's affecting people the most, I guess that's my, that remains my concern. And so if, if the best we can do is get a motion, uh, you know, of formally add to the agenda uh, as an action, posted for action to revisit this on the 24th, if that's, if that's the best we can do, I, I guess I would at least like to have that confirmed tonight as a formal, uh, posted for action, a formal action item in two weeks. I know that this is Claudia and I know I'm not, I'm not been called on. Can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I forgot my Robert's rules of order. Um, I don't know that we can guarantee that because we did not realize that we were going to get this high of a case rate at this particular time. And if things don't slow down in the next two weeks, we are not going to be able to deliver on that, Andrew, as much as we want to, unless we um, hire additional staff to support the nurses. There are hundreds and hundreds of emails behind currently, um, again, working 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Um, so I don't want to promise something that we aren't able to deliver because the cases just keep rising and rising. Um, I, I would be comfortable within a month, but I, I would suggest that we maybe say that we'll, we'll try, like let's address this again in two weeks and see where, the, where we are with the um, positivity rates so that we don't, come to that thing um, with some half-baked recommendations because we didn't have time to thoroughly vet it. Does that make sense? Well, I, for me, the administrative recommendations are one important part of... Oh, 
Sorry, we lost Andrew. He's got to switch over. His headset just died, so he'll be back in a second. Uh, sorry about that. Yep, you're good. Okay, am I back? Am I here? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Lost my headset. I mean, for me, you know, I don't, I would never want to not schedule a potential action item because administration may or may not be ready for a recommendation. Then board members can make their choice to you know, vote yes, vote no, vote to postpone or not make a motion in the first place. I mean, any of any of those things can can happen. So that's why I'm I'm I guess I'm asking Eric if you will make a you know officially tonight place that onto the agenda that it will be posted for possible action. And then action either will be taken or it won't. Maybe the administrative recommendation is ready and we act. Maybe it's not ready and we act. Maybe it's ready, but there's too much uncertainty and we don't act. But I think the board, I, I don't like the idea of waiting two weeks either, but if, if there's a at least an understanding that that's something that's going to be on the, the plate and the public can get ready for in, in two weeks, um, I guess I would rather know for sure we're going to vote in two weeks than just to have it fail right now so yeah andrew i guess what i would maybe suggest is that we commit to putting it on uh quarantining on the special uh, board meeting on the 24th um we're not asking administration hey you have to come forward with something because we understand that that uh there's a lot going on and you're behind and there's other things that are more important um so if you can, if you have something that's a recommendation, great. If you don't, that's fine. Andrew, if there is a, you know, you spend some time or I spend some time looking at the CDC guidelines as we understand them and want to propose something that we can confidently say, because again, uh, the board's actions to this point have, have been consistent in saying, if it follows CDC guidelines, we're willing to support it. So knowing that if you just came up with the Andrew Brecker model, it wouldn't pass. But uh, looking at the CDC guidelines and saying, hey, as I interpret them, would you would the board be willing to consider this for a quarantining guideline? Um, and so if the administration doesn't do it, Andrew, certainly that could be something that, that you could put forward and uh, for potential action on the 24th, I think that that would be fair. Does that make sense? Or are you in agreement with that? I mean, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather do it tonight because to me, this isn't my own plan. I think the CDC says the CDC doesn't anywhere in the current guidelines mention more than more than 10 days. So, uh, but if, if this is the way we have to do it is to put it on. Well, uh, yeah, that's where I, I guess that's where I'm at for the, the 24th, uh, so, unless there's more support than you and I to do something tonight. Well, Andrew, if you feel like you're able to make a motion tonight to modify our current quarantine guidelines that is aligned with the CDC. If you can make that motion tonight, then let's make the motion and vote on it. We have a, a motion on the isolation that we can take separately. I'm just gonna pause the conversation for a second, Steve, and ask you and or Kristen a question. So in the motion on the isolation guidelines, it says it's scheduled to be implemented on January 18th. Um, can I just ask when we voted to change the guidelines in December, it was effective the very next day. Can you just speak to why in this case, it's uh, oh, eight days away? Kristen, I'll let you go first. Um, again, it has to do with just this current variant and the fact of everything that's going on. We wanted to have a very clear cut date when this took place. Um, in order for us to, let's just talk about staff. Heidi would have to contact 170 staff members to readjust their isolation dates to get them back into school. Right now for students, it's 514 students that we would have to contact. And we don't have the manpower to try to do that. Um, we can't leave schools to do that. And that's the honest to God truth on that one. 
so so the the summary is that when we voted in December to change things, there were far less people on quarantine and isolation than there are today. And so the need for uh, the team to communicate people that this is going to impact is not just one day, it's several days to make sure. Correct. That correct? Okay, perfect. Correct. That's a completely understandable. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. All right, um, so just taking the pulse, if somebody's in a different spot, let me know. But I, I, what I'd like to see is if there's someone willing to make the current motion uh, to modify, uh, sorry, the recommended motion to modify the isolation protocols, which was brought forward and recommended by the administrative team. Uh, we can take a vote on that specifically. And then if Andrew has a separate motion in this topic, we can make that motion have any further discussion and vote on that. Is that fine? Brenda, you're good with that? Yes. Sorry, just, okay. Didn't mean to call you out specifically. I just all of a sudden I'm like aware of the, the screen. So, all right. So then I would ask if there's someone willing to make the recommended uh, motion around isolation protocols. Okay, go ahead, Laura. I move that effective January 18th, 2021, isolating of district students and staff for COVID-19 purposes shall be in accordance with the January 18th, 2022 isolation protocols as presented be approved. Second. Uh, any other discussion? I have, <clears throat> I have oh, one. Um, <clears throat> so I, un I understand that it might be it might be insurmountable to change uh, for people already who are in an isolation period, 514 kids and 100 some staff to reach. I get that. What barrier would there be though to saying that for new cases, why, why wouldn't we be able to start, why wouldn't we be able to start say Wednesday after sending out a notification with new rules for new situations, right? Cause that, that would actually like, yeah, that's my question. Kristen, I think what he's asking is uh, for anybody that uh, would notify us that they've got a new COVID positive after fill in the date uh, after Tuesday, after Wednesday, um, could we simply uh, start implementing the new five day for them while we're in the process of contacting the other 700 people, 800 people, sorry. I think I'm going to be honest and it's just going to depend upon how this week goes. Today is Today was worse than last week when we first came back from break. I, it, and it's, there's no, I mean, you know, we talked before about how our admin from the DOB are down in schools teaching. You know, there's no extra bodies to help us do things. Um, it's us, it's a team of, I know it sounds like a big team, but it's it's nonstop. Um, right, but I'm not talking about, I don't think I'm talking about something that would add work. I'm saying if you're on isolation, and you're saying how long it would take to call people who are isolated right now to tell them to change. I, I get that. Okay, that is an insurmountable obstacle. I'm talking about new people who report that they're on COVID, who we're not, we're just finding out about now, what would be what would be problematic in having people who make a new report being under the new rules? And I'm saying let's not if we can't call all those people to retroactively do it, if they're on isolation right now, okay, then we can't. But new for the new ones going forward, what would be problematic with that? We can try. That's the best I can offer. Josh is gonna to have to adjust our dashboard. Um, we'll have to educate everybody on the new process. It's it's a it's a big process, Andrew. It's a huge process. So there's a lot besides just the like I get that the changing is insurmountable if they're already on it. 
Right. But there's a dash, our dashboard is all um, IT is beyond my, my expertise by any means, but our dashboard that we enter all of our data into will need to be adjusted for that. We were planning on meeting with Josh at the end of the week to make that happen. I don't know what his schedule is like to make that happen sooner. And then it would be educating all the nurses and the contact tracers saying, this is the day that we're going to start this. They know it's coming. We just hadn't set a date yet on that, or, you know, we thought it would be Monday. So it, it feels like it should be a light switch, but it's not that simple. Well, I guess I would, I would, I would, if, if it means that people reporting now could have the shorter isolation period that we agree with, that's based on the CDC that our medical folks agree with, I would rather, I would rather the dashboard, I would rather the dashboard be not completely accurate for a couple of days if, if that even happened. I mean, the national dashboards you see sometimes data, you know, data missing or over the holiday or something. To me, this is just, this is, this is about telling new people who report in that they can have a shorter isolation. I understand what you're saying, but our dashboard is our source of truth. That's what we use for everything is our dashboard. 100%. Yep. It's so we... so, so um, let me ask that I hear exactly what you're saying. So if, if um, I don't even want to use my own child as a hypothetical. So a, a student or a, a, a woman calls in and says my child uh, on Thursday and says my child tested positive. If they did that on Thursday, uh, according to what I'm hearing on Thursday, you would tell that person, here's the, the guidelines that were in place uh, last week and you are out for 14 days. But if a child test came the following week on Tuesday, then you would tell them that they're out for the six days. Or, well, yeah, so 10 days this week, five days next week, returning on day six, returning on day 11 this week, correct. Okay. And we enter everything in as it's happening, as live as what we can do it, because like I said, that is our source of truth. Okay. So, so I, I guess then if that's what we're hearing, um, then I would just say that if you can try to at least communicate with the new cases sooner, that would be great. Um, and if you can't, then you can't. Okay, so as I think then we would need to probably do probably do an amendment because if we just pass this motion as is, it would be bind not a binding for the 18th and b binding to not do it till the 18th. So what what is the motion right now? Uh, the current motion says that isol uh, effective January 18th, 2021, isolating of district students and staff for COVID-19 purposes shall be in accordance with the January 18th, 2022 isolation protocols. We need to change the year on that, or it's going to be binding for last January. Uh, happens a lot. Good catch. So, can we just change the? Well, do we I'll, just? I'll change you, yeah. Can you? Can I ask the chair to ask unanimous consent to fix the date to 2022? Unanimous consent to change the date. Yes. And again, that's posted as recommended action. If Laura reads it the correct way, then that would be fine. And I think she did. So are we going to change that date to be January 12th, 2022? Well, that's what Andrew's, are you wordsmithing something, Andrew? Well, if we're going to say, I, I, I guess, I guess I'd like to see it at least be allowed to try. And if we passed it like this, they wouldn't be allowed to try. Right. So 
Can I offer a suggestion? Sure. Yep. If it said that effective no later than January 18th, 2022. Okay. All right, so uh, let's just add, is there unanimous consent to add the words no later than January 18th, 2022? Any unanimous consent to modify the motion? So the, the correct motion should read that effective no later than January 18th, 2022, isolating of district students and staff for COVID-19 purposes shall be in accordance with the January 18th, 2022 isolation protocols as presented be approved. All right, uh, so the motion there um, was made by Laura Layton and Warren, seconded by Brenda Warren. Are there any other discussion points? Go ahead, Laura. I just have a question for um, Kristen. So just to clarify, the the 20 day quarantine as proposed, that, that is only would apply to unvaccinated students if they're if students are vaccinated they would be eligible to return sooner regardless of the circumstance correct if a student is vaccinated or a staff member is vaccinated and unsymptomatic or non-symptomatic they do not need to quarantine at all so the only people doing the 20-day quarantines currently for the household would be those that are unvaccinated and a follow-up to that, do we have any idea of how many, what percentage of our students are vaccinated? We don't because it's not mandatorily right. reported. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, and I, I do have one more question. I'm not sure if this, Eric, if this would fit here or not about isolation. Or do we need if, to if vote? It's on, if it's on isolation, you certainly can okay. ask it now because we're about and, to and, vote. I'm sorry, contact tracing isolation. So, yeah. okay, I, I've had people contact me and I actually found, um, I may have been a little confused myself, but I'm hearing that um, some people, some parents are being told that there's no contract tracing being done. And my understanding is that it is still being done and that it's just at a broader level by class. If you could just clarify what is being done by the district in terms of contact tracing for isolation and quarantine. We are not contact tracing any longer within the classroom or sports. Um, anytime that we, and we do monitor like what teachers or what classrooms, um, what sports, what activities their numbers are rising on. And then we will look at a contact tracing that, you know, those um, specific areas. The problem that we run into is when you're looking at small classes, especially small classrooms, if we send a letter home saying that you have a positive in your classroom, it ends up being a HIPAA violation because everybody knows that, and I'm gonna use a hypothetical, Jane Doe is out. Everybody knows Jane Doe is out with COVID. So we're very concerned about you know, HIPAA and FERPA as far as that being um, released and notified out that direction. I think the most important thing that we can tell the community right now, and I would tell this to anybody that I was talking to, is if you have any symptoms, and I don't care how mild they are, if you've got a sniffle, a sore throat, a cough, you know, headache, nausea, vomiting, et cetera, have a COVID test because chances are right now it's COVID. Don't ignore it. So you had mentioned though that the contract chasers are still very busy. So could you explain the difference between what they're doing now as opposed to before? Yep. So every single one of these families that are calling in saying that their children are sick or someone in their household test positive or they were with a family over the holidays and there's positive, every single one of those families is getting a phone call. So we can find out what that history might be. We can give them their quarantine or isolation dates, depending upon their situation, recommend testing, sending out emails to them. So if I you know, look at the, the dashboard right now, between quarantine and isolation, just of students, we're at about 2,200 kids. Now I know that's not 2,200 families. I mean, obviously um, we've got some you know, families that we've got whole entire families that are isolated, but let's say it's even 1,500, every single one of them have gotten a phone call from us. 
and our contact tracers and our nurses are doing that in addition to our nursing duties. Following up from anything we received from Brown County Health Department, those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, so we have a motion on the table uh, with a second um, that was modified by unanimous consent. Any other questions specifically on isolation protocols and then we'll revisit quarantines. No. All right, Beth, I think we are ready to vote on isolation protocols. Thanks, Eric. Online voting has been opened. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries uh, seven zero. Andrew, uh, do you have another motion that you'd like to make? If, if we are confirming right now that we will be posted for action on the 24th, and that's binding. I guess I can, well, I can, I can say I'm pretty sure I could make a motion. And I'm quite sure that I could make a motion that aligns with, with CDC. I guess I, I can't be certain enough to do that tonight. So I would be open to making one on the, on the 24th. Okay. Um, so short of, uh, having a motion that we're prepared to vote on, that would be the only thing. So e if either you and, or the district staff came and said, yep, we have a proposal for you that's aligned with CDC guidelines. Um, I'm not going to post it for action if we don't have that, but we'll know obviously ahead of time, we're already posted for the meeting, um, on the 24th. So wait, what I'm sorry, what? Well, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to put this on the agenda for a vote if there's not a motion to be but made. But it has to be posted for potential action. Otherwise we can't make a Correct. motion and vote. Yes, yes. So it will be posted for potential action. And okay. whether, whether, whether the motion comes from you or from the district staff is something for us to consider. We can figure that out. All right. All right. Um, that takes us off of that topic and on to the 2022-23 school year calendar. Um, so I'll step in. Uh, Vicki and her team were driving this. So what you have is a draft of the uh, calendar and uh, for 2022 through 2023. Uh, and uh, this has been reviewed uh, multiple times by the calendar team. Uh, that team includes members of uh, certified staff, support staff, and administrative team. Uh, and you'll find on there uh, that uh, draft calendar for uh, 2022 through 2023. Uh, and you'll find all of the um, subsequent uh, uh, dates as you scroll through there. Uh, and you get down to the bottom, you'll see the early release dates, et cetera. So I, uh, again, been through the uh, entire review process uh, and ready for action at this time. Happy to answer or try to answer any questions that you might have. I would just add that uh, I, again, wasn't at the, or part of the committee that heard this presentation uh, but I was in the room listening in, in Vicki's update and uh, the extensive work that went into this process with teachers, administrators, and students, I thought was incredible. And uh, it's definitely a significant improvement uh, from past calendars. So just want to applaud the work that went into it. Nancy. Okay, so actions taken to address survey concerns. Okay, and so you addressed the, what's going to be happening next year for the professional development days. Is that, am I reading that right? So that um, like next year, there's gonna be two full days of professional development and then four early release days. 
Is that right? Yep. Right. What did we have for this year? Seven. Seven early release days. So if we talk about full days and stuff, we're talking at seven sessions, and now we're going to go to eight next year. Because two, you know, full day is like two sessions, right? Like a whole day is two early release days, more than that, actually. So it's actually going to be more professional development next year. From a, a strictly from a minute standpoint? Yeah, I know they calculated by time, Nancy. I'll be honest with you. I don't recall if there were more minutes added. I thought it was the same number of minutes, but I don't want to speak out of turn uh, for the committee. Four early release days instead of seven, but then two full days. Okay. Yeah. So the, the the feedback that I heard was that there it was unanimous from everyone that early release professional development days are not good for anybody. They're not good for students. That staff didn't like them. That families didn't like them. And so the uh, every effort was made to re, to eliminate as many of those as they could, and to be able to go from seven to four um, was a, a big improvement. Okay. We can get that we can get back to you on that too. I know that that was a huge topic of conversation with them. I'm just not, I don't know the answer to that, but we can find that out and get that back to you. All right. Um, is someone willing to make the motion to recommend the school calendar? I'll move to approve the school calendar as presented for 2022-2023. Second. Any other discussion? All right, Beth, we're ready to vote. Online voting has been opened. I'm refreshing to try to, okay. Thank you. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item C, contracts under Wisconsin State section 118.24 and 118.22. And uh, this uh, ensures that uh, we are compliant with state statutes and prepares us for uh, both negotiations and then upon subsequent negotiations, uh, ex extension of contracts. Uh, to teachers and staff. Uh, I think uh, if Angie were on, she would tell you, you know, one of the, the challenges that we have is in the on year of the biennial budget, we're always waiting for the state to pass the budget in the off year. Uh, when we're able to act uh, in a, an expedient manner, then that allows us to ensure that we have this work done prior to the end of the uh, contract year so that uh, we're not going through the process of uh, backdating and journal entering all those. So this puts us in position to get that done. Andrew? So is this some type of technical action that goes along with the, the approval of the contracts like we've always done? Or is, this, or is this the approval of the contracts that we've usually done? We always did the administrate, we always had a list of a list of the administrative contracts and we knew what we were voting on except le until last year. Melissa, I don't know if you want to jump in here and just uh, uh, add context for the, the compliance with the state statutory piece. Andrew, I think um, and under Steve's leadership, we've moved away from providing the list of names the board can approve the issuance of contracts in pursuant to 118.24 for administrators and 118.22 is for teachers. But last year we did not provide a list of administrators and statutorily it's not required. The board just simply needs to give authority for the issuance of the contracts. And we're not bringing forward any um, non-renewals of those contracts to the board. Yeah, um, I, I'm. To me, this is going. 
wildly too far into into hands off <clears throat> territory. I certainly I certainly can't vote on a list that I don't I don't know who's on it. Um, I don't think uh, I I think contract renewals are normal in in other units of government. Are they not to to have a, a list? I, I I mean I don't think the city would ever. I mean, the, the city breaks it down to individual names at the high levels. I'm just talking about, about a list. Um, I, I won't take up a lot of time if there isn't majority agreement, and I'll just vote no because the, the list isn't there. Um, I know another thing that we did, and I guess in, in retrospect, trying to work trying to work collaboratively and getting things done, which is what we're told we're supposed to do, uh, didn't work out that well because another thing we, I remember talking about year, years ago that we just adopted as, because we thought it was a good practice was, uh, especially with the superintendent's contract, that was important enough that even though it would roll over to a third year by statute and by the letter of the contract, we thought that was a good thing to, you know, to proactively do. So if that's out as well as the administrators on the list, uh, this to me is going much too far. I, I certainly can't vote yes on something and be questioned about who's, who just, what contracts they vote on and have to have to say, I don't, I don't really know. So I, I would be interested if others have, thoughts on this and then I won't take up a lot of time with it because I know what the outcome will be. Andrew, can I ask a question? Um, so we as a board vote on everyone who comes into our district. We approve their contract. We did it tonight. Um, so there's not a single person, uh, maybe I can't say that, but there, anyone who's under contract with the district, we approve initially um, when they start with the district. So I'm wondering why you would need assuming that you've already approved all of the contracts, why do you need to see them annually if you've seen them when they came into the district the first time? Well, because it creates lifetime tenure, right? It creates, un, it creates lifetime tenure that the, the board won't even officially see. Um, that's, that's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down to for me. If I'm asked, if I'm asked, did you, did you vote, did you vote to continue the, you know, the rollovers for X, Y, and Z? I'm, I should be able to say yes, or I should be able to say no. I shouldn't have to say, I don't know. And I don't, why is this, why is this so important when the, when the list already exists? And like a practice that goes back to before I was first on the board the first time, why so important to get rid of this? Well, I mean, I'll just share, I'm abstaining from this vote. So I'm going to allow the rest of the board members to, to weigh in here. If they have any comments. Why are you abstaining? Uh, I have uh, family members who would be impacted by the contracts. So conflict of interest. Can we okay this or it's, we're doing the list? This allows us to renew the contracts for all of our teachers and administrators. So I think as Eric, as, oh, sorry, Steve, as Eric pointed out, the, the board has, is the ultimate em employer with respect to hiring and firing. The um, board has voted to hire every single one of the individuals who would be given the contracts. The district has not come forward following um, the language in the handbook regarding terminations or the statutory requirements to recommend any non-renewals. So for all of those individuals that the board has hired, those would be all the individuals who would be getting a, a renewal of a contract. With this respect to lifetime tenure, um, 
we don't have lifetime tenure. What we have is um, requirements under 118.22 and 118.24 with respect to renewal and non-renewal of contracts, as well as just cause in the employee handbook with respect to uh, employees termination. So with, with, in regards to whether the board could take the list of employees that would be brought for contract renewal and indicate that they didn't want to renew any specific individual's uh, contract, that would not be following the just cause language in the handbook and it would not be following 118.22 or 118.24. So, again, the question about why it's so important to to abandon this practice where it was in the agenda who was um, who we were who we were renewing, and it's been it's been that way for what is I, I don't I just don't see the harm aspect in the list of administrators being there. The teachers, because of the the number, we did do a an approval of the general teacher contract uh, because we were approving in essence a, a master contract, which I think is perhaps slightly, slightly different. So, so my understanding is this is posted in the identical same manner as we posted last year. And I believe it was a seven zero vote, except Eric, I believe abstained last year. That is correct. From my standpoint, last year was the first year and only year I've done this, and this is how we did it, and it seemed to go well, so I'm fine without a list. Um, I'm comfortable voting on this as it is, because this is how, from my standpoint, it's always been. I agree. I think we've hired um, the people, and um, we, um, <clears throat> our managers, our, uh, um, Steve's team is in charge of issuing the contracts. And if there are no non-renewals, then I pretty much know who we're voting on anyway, because I know who sits in those administrative positions. Well, why didn't we change it years ago if there was, if this was so unimportant? Go ahead. I um, was not here last year for this, but I, I just, to me, just listening to the discussion and understanding that it just seems like a process improvement. It seems like it may be um, there for the intent of not bringing something back. We've already approved these teachers coming to the district to reapprove re the contract or the renewals. Um, I think it's, that's the way I look at it is it's just, saving some some time and letting the administration um, manage the performance of their of their of their staff um, but I appreciate the questions you're bringing forward Andrew but that's for me just coming in fresh that's kind of the way I look at it and the reason I would support this as is and and um, not seeing the um, nefarious intent behind it or or something that would not, be um, in the best interest of the district because we are approving those teachers when they come in initially. Again, the, the teacher is a master, teachers are a master contract. It's the, it's administrative contracts that we did, we did from a list. Um, and can I ask a process uh, question? How, how is the administrator contract not a master contract when the teacher contract is a master contract? What am I missing there? I just want to make sure I'm seeking clarification. Sure, I believe as the um, well, the, the teacher the teacher contracts are all um, they're standardized. Salaries are completely standardized off a chart. I think there's some they're all people with the same license. There are and I think there's more differences among administrators. The administrators receive the all the administrators on under one eighteen twenty four received the same contract, the same template contract, and they also have a salary schedule as the teachers. Yeah, we have administrators who aren't on 118.24 as well, or what aren't bound by, we aren't, we use similar procedures, but there are administrators that were not bound to 
cover under 118.24, correct? The, we have technical um, employees and managers, and that's not being brought forward in tonight's motion. This is just the under right, but there's there's administrators who aren't educational administrators that we employ, right? They're, and I'm not going to say the name of any position because then someone's going to think this is something way different than what this is. But we at one time, right? We used to have a situation which I'm glad we moved away from that um, we required any position of administrator we tried to find right a, a someone who had also had an educational administrator license even if we weren't required to by law unless that was before your time under 11824 non education administrators are specifically enumerated in the statute as being covered under the statute so um, individuals in the chief um, the uh, business office, human resources, those sorts of positions are specifically noted in 118.24 as receiving contracts, and they're on this list. Non-licensed too, though? I mean, I know school business official is a license. Correct. So 118.24 includes non-licensed administrators too. Correct. For, for whom I want to say, I want to be clear, administrators for whom a state licensure is not required? A DPI for whom a DPI license is not required. They still get 118.24. There's specific Look, provisions in the statute, correct. All right, I still, I'm, the, the amount of, the, the amount of, of checks and balances, both symbolic and substantive that have just vanished is, is astonishing. So I'll, I'll vote no. And we'll move on. All right. Is there anyone uh, to make the motion? Go ahead. I move that the issuance of contracts as outlined under Wisconsin statute section 118.24 and 118.22 for the 2022-23 school year as presented be approved. I'll second. Any other discussion? All right, Beth, we're set to vote. Online voting has been opened. Seems like it's taking just a minute. System's a little slow. Just give it a second. Okay. Is it frozen for everyone? Yes. Okay. Why don't I quick do a voice vote? If everyone's comfortable with that. Okay. Um, Vanden Heuvel? Abstain. Med? Aye. Becker? No. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Leighton and Warren? Aye. And Welch? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries five to one. All right, moving on to item D, policy 433, interdistrict transfers. Is there a motion? I move that the revisions to the Board of Education Policy 433 interdistrict transfers as presented be approved. I'll second. Second. We had a second by Dawn that came in first. Um, any discussion? All right. Beth, what do you want to do? Um, we can try it one more time. I just opened online voting. If you don't get it through, I'll just do um, a quick voice vote. Yep, for the rest. It popped up right away. Okay, wonderful. Okay, all votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. 
All right, moving on to the rule. Is someone willing to make the motion? I move that the revisions to Board of Education Rule 433 intradistrict transfers as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion there? All right, Beth, we're all set. Okay, online voting has been opened. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries 7-0. Uh, moving on to item F, policy 443.1, student dress. Anyone want to have a discussion? I move, okay, I move that the revisions to Board of Education policy 443.1, student dress as presented be approved. Can I just stop, Brenda, one second? The only problem with that, Brenda, is there have not been the full changes to this policy coming out of the Policy and Governance Committee, so I don't think it's in final format because there was no final agreement. So, for example, the sunset clause at the end of the policy in Section 4G is still in there. Yeah, I mean, I... I was curious why this ended up on our agenda to begin with, because I knew we had talked about revisiting this in our um, next policy and governance committee. They, they did discuss it at the last meeting and there was no consensus in the, the um, direction was to bring this forward. They gave me directions of what to revise, but there was no, no direction or no consensus and from the committee as to what the changes would be and they wanted to the whole entire board to review the changes. So there should be a, uh, a discussion item then. Well, you can, you can do discussion and action if you would like. Okay, so. So we, we don't have to take action on this if it's just here for discussion and we, you know, we don't want to end up taking the vote, we don't have to. So should I withdraw my motion and we discuss first and then decide if we want to put that motion forward? Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. All right. Um, so just real quick history for anyone who's just tuning in. Um, we, this, the board has been discussing this for quite some time. I, my first recollection was uh, the fall of 2019. Um, we, we passed a clause that essentially, you know, made some improvements to the motion around um, some of the, the uh, language that was in there, the headwear um, and policy there was uh, difficult to decide on where we landed at the time was to put something in there around uh, administrators uh, discretion. Um, and we put a sunset clause at the time that said we will revisit this in, uh, I believe, the summer of 2020. Obviously, the pandemic uh, took over at that time. We weren't in person anyway. Um, and so I, I believe we extended the sunset clause uh, to the end of this year. It's now come back to our policy and governance committee. I don't know if anyone on that committee wants to. Obviously, you've still been stuck with it. If you can shine some light on to what your discussions have been, um, and then we can have further discussion if necessary. Go ahead, Laura. Um, as the chair of the Policy and Governance Committee, I was not at the meeting where the results of the survey were discussed. Um, so I don't have anything to add in terms of insight for that. I do know, um, I'm just reading the survey results. There was um, a lot of, of a lot of great feedback, and I actually I I always love reading open comments, especially from the students. And and um, some are humorous, and some are you know, um, it was just always a good read to see the the comments. And I think one of the big things that stuck out to me, just in terms of of headwear. Um, and that's reflected in here is that headwear is okay as long as it's not, um, was it complies with the regulations set forth in this policy, it's not obscuring the face. Um, and I think that there's some, one of the um, comments 
within, I'll see if I can find it here quickly. Um, one of the comments within the open feedback, um, which I don't wanna hold up the meeting, but maybe we can come back to it after some other comments, but was um, particularly powerful in terms of um, being culturally responsive in allowing headwear. So I'll just, I'll state that and I can read from it as soon as I find it, but I don't wanna take up time looking for that. Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm on the policy and governance committee. And um, I think the <clears throat> discussions that we had are, you can see rough um, changes that were made in the red line document. Um, those, those changes pretty much represent the discussion that we had. Um, there wasn't a unanimous consensus that, that these changes that are in there um, uh, should be in there. And so that's why we thought we would make the ch ask Melissa to make the changes and then bring it back to the policy and governance committee, but also getting, there's just three of us on the policy and governance committee. And we thought it would be useful to have the in, um, input from other board members as to what they think about the changes that are in there. Okay, so that provides more clarification. So policy and governance worked through it, made some adjustments, wasn't general consensus, wanted to bring it back here for further discussion. And then hopefully that provides further guidance to that committee to then bring forward something that we feel better about. Okay. Right. And, less, and then I think if the board is, gets to the point where we feel like we're pretty unanimous, we do have the option to vote. Sure. So, my overall opinion on this, uh, tying it back to an earlier discussion that we had tonight, is that there are a lot of uh, issues that are facing uh, facing us as a board and facing our district. This is something where there, uh, you know, my takeaway from the survey was it's all over the board. I mean, when, when you looked at people's opinions, regardless of if it was administrators, uh, students, it looked like a pinwheel in terms of, in fact, I think there was some groups that were almost 20%, you know, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, th this is something that uh, can be viewed as complex and controversial. And, and frankly, I don't know that it's, uh, in the, the top five greatest things that's facing our, our board tonight. So, um, you know, for me personally, uh, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm ready to, to, to make a strong recommendation and to take a stance on it. When I look at the, the, you know, the additions that have been there, you know, when I see behavior that is a substantial disruption and a substantial disruption is on a case by case basis, that's just as gray as saying administrator uh, discretion. Well, what's a disruption in one school or a substantial disruption is not in another school. And so that's just another way to phrase it. So um, I guess that <laughs> I, I'm more in favor right now, at least on uh, kind of that local control. I understand that that creates discrepancies throughout our district. I don't know that this policy, the way that it's worded, doesn't still continue to do that. And so I guess I would be in favor of, of the way that it's posted tonight. I, I kind of understand your ambivalence. I, but one of the things that we did hear of over and over again is to have a consistent policy throughout the district. That was that that was one of the most consistent points that people made. So, um, you know, leaving it building to building seems to cause a certain amount of um, anxiety and confusion um, with our staff. So. If there was one thing that I would ask, actually, would be that we did have a consistent policy throughout the, the um, throughout the district. So I guess I'm going to have to disagree on that. Yeah, I guess my only take would be that if we were to make a consistent policy, we know that there's a, and I guess this is one way or the other, that there's going to be a portion of our staff who we hear consensus are stressed out there's going to be a portion of our staff who are, or this is going to push them even further, right? This is going to be another button. This is going to be another. So I'm not saying that, that I want to punt forever. And I guess I understand the need for something that's consistent. I don't know that, that needing to make something consistent today is, is in our best interest. That would be my, 
rebuttal to your rebuttal. Eric, the, the board is going to have to make a decision, however, because we this policy is in our student expectation book. And in order to get those printed, we need a final policy. So within the next few months, we're going to need a decision. Sure. So, so then my, my take would be I am supportive of the, the red line to copy the, the language that's in there. And then would you then um, take out section 4G then that sunsets the... Yes, text yes. Text? And then I would take out the sunset clause. Not, and again, policy and governance will probably look at this again at some point, but to take out the sunset clause and uh, in agreement with the, the other language. That's just me. So I guess I would be uh, removing that sunset clause and then would approve it as it's presented. Um, I think I would be, I, I like the direction that it's going with the, the, the red line. I think if there's There's certain things when you talk about what is a substantial disruption and what what isn't that might be something I'd want to think about something I might want to ask some questions of, of administrators and um, and others and not necessarily not necessarily try to ask every possible question here before voting so I do want to vote on something that I believe I, I like what happened with headwear because we heard the, you know, yes, but what if they're concealing stuff? And we're clearly saying here that if, if you're concealing items that can't be there, then they can say you have to not wear the headwear. That's fair, that's reasonable. Uh, but I do think there's some to vote on it, to vote on it tonight with there being I share the concern about not wanting it to not wanting the redlined language and definitions to mean any interpretation is is okay that a staff member wants to make about what's substantial. I don't think it is, but again, I don't want to ask 20 questions about was well, this substantial, this substantial. Um, I'd like to see if we could vote on it next month. Um, is that reasonable? Yes, I think that that's reasonable. That was the original plan. I think it was bring it back to the board at this point to get any feedback that might help the policy and governance committee um, make decisions next month. I do have a question, um, Eric, when you were talking, um, I thought you were saying that you wanted to leave things the way they are and not change the policy. And then at the end, I heard you say you would vote for the policy, the red line policy, which includes all the changes. Can you just clarify for me where you're, where you yeah, are? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think um, behavior that, that causes substantial disruption, um, again, not gonna get into the, the 20 questions, but I, I feel like that, keeps the policy consistent enough where it says absolutely no, never, you can't do this, or yes, you know, uh, hats are, or, or headwear is a, anyone can wear whatever they want, whenever they want. So to me, uh, this language um, provides that compromise. So I, I, I'm oh, supportive. Okay. Yep, I'm supportive of this as a transition from the way the policy was. Okay. All right. Thanks. I just offer the substantial material disruption language is governed by the First Amendment because student dress is considered First Amendment. So that's the standard that we must go with with respect to what is a material and substantial disruption. The committee had asked for further clarification in addition to paragraph one, and I was able to find additional clarification but there will never be a bright line rule because it will always be within that context of a First Amendment analysis. Go ahead, Laura. Can I ask you, Melissa, um, 
this this language um because i know you often look at other what other districts are doing kind of in comparison is this out of line with kind of a what you would think of as a a, a norm of any sort or is this pretty pretty standard this is not consistent with the model WASB policy or other models, but the board had asked for more description. So I okay. found the best of what I could find pursuant to what the board had asked for. Thank you. Well, it seems like we're not ready to vote. Uh, if you're on the policy and governance committee, maybe this is as clear as mud, but you tried it and we gave you hopefully made it not more complex and uh, bring it back and knowing that we do probably need to take some action. Um, and maybe you can follow up individually with any board members not on the policy and governance committee. So. All right, uh, any other comments there? Otherwise we'll move on and, and kick that back to the committee. All right, very good. Then uh, moving on to agenda setting. Um, if you take a look at the dates, uh, there were some recent modifications. Um, and I don't know if. Eric, this, I'm sorry, they're not reflected on that. They're slide. not reflected on the there. Okay. We'll be updated tomorrow, though. Okay, so we'll, we'll update this. But uh, there was a request in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day to move the um, board meetings that were scheduled on Monday the 17th. Uh, those have been reflected um for the board members that are attending those um there are several committees that will be moved uh, or sorry several uh, board committee meetings that were moved to january 24th those will be posted tomorrow in addition to uh the special board meeting which will be also on the 24th not the 17th so changes will be reflected starting tomorrow All right, um, with that then, if there's no other comments, um, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? All right, and we will conclude the meeting at 8.38. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Bye. -bye. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920 448 2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible. <music>